After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Um, well, last week we studied the most famous scripture in the entire Bible. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we spent a lot of time talking about what this verse means and how we're to understand it for our lives. But one thing that we didn't talk about is something that many of us were probably thinking and asking ourselves, because it says we'll have eternal life. Um, but, you know, eternal life, doesn't that kind of sound long? Like a really long time to have eternal life? What are we going to be doing throughout all of eternity? And the TV show, The Good Place, a few people have seen The Good Place, yeah. It's a great show. I resisted watching it for a long time because I thought it would be making fun of Christians. You know, I might get all up in my feelings with that. But uh, I decided to watch it, and it doesn't really make fun of Christians, but it is a totally secular account of what the afterlife might be like. And it's a really great show. It didn't disappoint. A uh, couple of seasons approach Parks and Rec level funny to me. Uh, so, but more than that, it deals with some really serious topics, things such as morality, philosophy, and death. And it does so in a winsome and kind of creative way as it goes about. And as I watch the show, there's so many twists and turns. So I'm going to reveal like a little bit of the ending, but honestly, it is like the smallest of twists that are in the show. So there's a, a million different things if you can still watch the show um, if you want. But at, at the end, I ended up just being really bummed out by the show. It just like left me feeling like, uh, oh, well, that was that. And it just put a, a bad taste in my mouth for the whole show because of the way that it ended. You, because, and here's how, how it happened. How do you end a show that's about heaven? I mean, it's hard because heaven goes on forever, right? So hypothetically, these people can never die. They just continue on into eternity. And in this show, you have these characters that you genuinely love, and they're the, in this, the good place. And they essentially, while they're in the good place, they have an infinite number of magical wishes. And so if you want to go play uh, football, football with your favorite quarterback, what's his name, Blake Bortles? What's his name, Mark? Blake Bortles, yeah, he was, the, he was the quarterback of the Jacksonville Jaguars at that time. Uh, if you don't know that, don't worry about it, because not many people do. Um, but if you want to play football with him, you can play with him all you want. If you want to go gallivanting around Europe, go for it. If you just want to play Madden all day long at home, that's your wish. Do whatever you want to do. And in a place like this, the way that the authors thought about it is that it would get boring. And so they decided that if you get bored of eternal life, 
you should be able to end it. And so one by one, you watch these characters that you love walk through a final door of death where they go into nothingness, which feels rather nihilistic to me. But you know, I get it, because if heaven is ju just this choose-your-own-adventure of infinite magical hedonism, where you get to do whatever you want for all eternity, whenever you want, you would eventually get bored, because you are still a finite person with finite desires. Don't get me wrong, I would love to do whatever I want for a few million years. Okay, yesterday, my kids went to swimming lessons with my wife. It was delightful. I did whatever I wanted for like two hours, and I started to get bored at the end of it. But if that is all you have, then you will get boring. Because, and, and honestly, doing whatever you want isn't ultimately satisfying. It requires more to bring true satisfaction. So what is Jesus promising when he promises us eternal life? And how is this different than the version of eternal life that's depicted in the good place? Jesus actually defines eternal life for us in John chapter 17. We're going to be talking about eternal life a lot. Um, I'm not going to be able to, throughout the entire book of John, it's something that comes up over and over again. It's a theme as we go through this series. And so I'm not going to give you everything that we could possibly know about eternal life today, but we do want to go over basically what it is. And so Jesus gives us a definition of what is eternal life in, in John chapter 17. And he says this, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they know you. Jesus is praying at this point. He's praying to his Father, and he's saying that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. An essential ingredient in an eternal life that could be satisfying and rich and joyful eternally is that God himself is there. Because we are finite creatures, but he is an infinite creature. He is an infinite being that we could enjoy and know forever. With an infinite God, we can imagine an infinite existence that doesn't grow boring. One author puts it like this, what if heaven is about meeting the source and satisfaction of our deepest longing, not just a better version of what we already know and understand? Think about that. What if heaven is about meeting the source and satisfaction of our deepest longing, longing not just having a better version of what we already know? We don't think about God's infinity and his eternality enough, and that is exactly what this passage is about. This passage tells us this. If you actually believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, if you believe that Jesus is the eternal son of God, how would it change your life? If you believe that he was eternal, how would it change your life? At least two ways in this passage. First, if you believe that he was the eternal son of God, you would have no problem submitting to him in humility. No problem with it, because you would understand who he is. A right view of him helps you to have a right view of yourself. And secondly, if you had a right view of him, the eternal son of God, you would have no problem imagining an eternal life that sounds pleasant and good. No problem with it. It would be a joyful and easy thing for you to think through. So let's dive into this passage. Point number one, you would have no problem submitting to him in humility. Our passage starts today in John chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 22. And so I'm going to continue to read for us. We heard it just a moment again. We're going to be reading through part this passage kind of verse by verse, and I'll stop to make comments as we go through. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing. Uh-oh, we got a little competition, all right? We got, got a little, little, little rivalry going on here. Got dual baptizers going on at Ana near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. Maybe just a little plug for, you know, baptism by immersion, but I'll continue uh, before I get myself in trouble uh, with any of the Presbyterians in the room. For John had not yet been put into prison. Just a little author's note so that we know where we are in the story. John's not in prison yet, obviously. He's baptizing people. 
Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and they said, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. Uh Uh-oh. John's disciples are a little concerned. They go to him and they say, hey, John, look what's happening over here. It's a competition. I like to think about it like Aziz and Sari might say it. He's like, yo, JTB, Jesus is over there baptizing people. What are you going to do about it? Before Jesus came along, John was the top religious leader. He had been following and respected. He had a following and he was respected. He was the baptizing people. And now John the Baptist's followers saw Jesus as a threat. Jesus was out there baptizing more people than John. And so what's he going to do? How's he going to respond? John responds in the most amazing way. Look, verse 28. You yourselves bear witness, bear me witness, that I said, I am not the Christ, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. And so what John is saying is like, look, I'm a nobody. He's in, he's in everything. He's, he's the somebody. I'm a nobody. He, he is the bridegroom. I'm just the best man. And what type of egotistical maniac would I have to be to say, hey, everybody pay me attention at the groom's wedding as the best man? Hopefully your best man, if you're married, was better than that. And so John understands that he has to point to Jesus. He must increase and I must decrease. This takes some humility. I mean, before Jesus came along, John was the most well-respected rabbi around. He was out there making a name for himself. And now Jesus comes around and the disciples are like, what's going on? Why, isn't, why, why are we going down? Why are we no longer number one? And what empowers this kind of humility? Well, it's just this, that he doesn't see Jesus as competition. He actually believes that Jesus is who he says he is. The eternal son of God. And if we actually believe that Jesus is who he says he is, we'd have the same kind of humility. He must increase and I must decrease. The author of the gospel helps us by describing who Jesus is after this. And he goes into some detail about who he is. And first thing he says, verse 31, is he who comes from above is above all. He who is of earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He came, so it's saying, what he's saying is that Jesus came from above. He's not just a great man. He is the son of God who has existed throughout eternity past and will continue to exist through eternity future. He has lived with the Father and the Spirit in perfect harmony throughout eternity. A number that we can't fathom. He who came from above is above all. What does it mean to be above all? Well, you can think about it a couple different ways. First, he's number one in that org chart, okay? You might look at the org chart and say, okay, who's at the top? Well, Jesus is obviously at the top. And so John the Baptist is like, look, I'm just flattered that I might, that I get on the same org chart, okay? I'm, I'm down here somewhere, but I'm pretty far down there. But you might also say that he who is above all has a high vantage point. When Megan and I first moved to Boston, it was, we moved to Boston like 12 years ago. And um, it it was a different day 12 years ago, okay? We didn't have turn-by-turn navigation on our phones. That's how long 12 years ago was. So we would go home and print off a sheet of paper from MapQuest, and then we would give each other directions as we tried to get, get around this crazy city. If you think driving in Boston is hard today, imagine doing it without turn-by-turn, without Google, okay? No Google Maps. You're just, you're just guessing, okay? And if you get really good at it, this is, this is what you, if you learn your commute, and you get really good at it. You can turn on the radio or turn on the TV and listen because what they would do 10 years ago, I don't know if they still do this or not. I've got no clue. I haven't turned on local television in a very long time. But what they used to do is they would 
you know, the Channel 5 or whatever would send a helicopter up in the sky and they'd say, oh, yeah, there's uh, traffic at the ba brain tree split. I don't know what the brain tree split is, but there's always traffic at the brain tree split. And you just know to avoid that. And so you would listen as they get this high vantage point. They could see where the problems were and what was happening. And you would know which area of the city to avoid. Jesus has this kind of above all vantage point. When you recognize that he is above all, it's easy to submit to him in humility. Because he's got this vantage point where he sees the entire map. He sees it all. And so we can say, I can submit my life to him because he knows better than I do. I trust him. He's leading me. He's above all. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know why we're going down these roads. This is what he is doing, though. And I trust him in all of his leadership. Verse 32, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Who rece whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. That's a weird way of saying that. Let's, let's talk about this for just a second. What the author is trying to say, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. So Jesus is declaring who he is, yet people aren't receiving him. I have one child I can still tell stories about, okay? Uh, and that, that's my three-year-old. I, I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 3-year-old. The 10-year-old and the 7-year-old, you know, I have to get their permission before I share a story. The 3-year-old, you know, he doesn't get that, response, that authority yet, okay? So the 3-year-old, he's gotten into this thing re recently where he just likes to uh, contradict whatever we have to say. So we'll say, hey, well, he'll say, hey, can I open my window? He won't ask. There's no can't, will you, please. It's just open my window while we're driving down the, the street in the car. And, hey, bud, it's cold outside. Can't open your window. No, it's not. Like, it's November in Boston, Rowan. It's cold. And he's, no, it's not. Open my window. Just, just telling us. Nope. Well, hey, buddy, you need to eat your vegetables. They're good for you. No, they're not. I feel like I'm being gaslit by a three-year-old. He's just, he's just telling me. He's just telling me how it is. And this is often how we approach the vantage point of Jesus. Even though he is above all and his testimony is true, we don't receive his testimony. We look at him and we say, no, it's not. It's not true. And we go our own way into irreligion. But John tells us that the Christian must, verse 33, set your seal to the fact that God is true. Now, this is a really weird way of saying you must believe. What does it mean to set your seal? Now, this is going back to the, the days, and we're all familiar with this, when uh, different people would have a, a wax seal that they would put on an envelope to say, this is coming to me. And so if you wrote a letter and you put an envelope with a wax seal on it and you put your family crest or your insignia on it and you sent it, then the person who opened it would know that that came from you and that you are absolutely committed to whatever is inside of it. It was like a signature, a contract saying, I'm committed to living out whatever is in this. And so for us to set our seal upon Christ is for us, it means for us to be completely committed to whatever he says, whatever he asks of us. That is what it means to set our seal to him. It, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that you can approach Jesus and say, you know, I'll give this a try. We'll see if this works. If you try Jesus out like that, like a new workout plan, membership at the gym, whatever it might be, you're never going to get the benefits of Jesus. Because that's not what Jesus demands. Jesus demands to be God in your life. You can't just take a little sample. You have to say, I've set my seal upon this, and whatever he says I am committed to, absolutely committed to, that's what it means to follow Christ. You can't just give him a try. You have to say, here's my life. I hand it over. You must become greater. I must become less. You can't go to Jesus and say, look at me. Look at all that I've done. Will you take me now? Am I good enough now? All you can do is say, you've done it all. You must become greater in my life. I must become less. Your infinite, 
I'm finite. I trust you. Verse 34. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and gives all things into his hand. Okay, so for, for he whom God has sent utters the words of God. Jesus is not simply mentioning words about God. Jesus is uttering the words of God. He is speaking the words of God. And then it says the Father loves the Son. This eternal love that has gone on throughout eternity past and has given all things into his hand. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Now that's a a little bit of a confusing phrase. Um, Let me break that down just a little bit for us. Throughout the Old Testament, you would have prophets who would be sent by God to deliver the message of God according to the measure of the Spirit given to them. So they would be given, Jeremiah, Isaiah, be given a measure of the Spirit to deliver the message of God according to that measure. But when we get to Jesus, we get the full measure without limit of the Spirit. What it's saying is that Jesus has eternal access, complete access to the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God is fully on Christ because he is God. And yes, it does mean that he gives the Spirit to us also. We have that. That's also true from the Scripture. But here it's talking about Jesus, full Spirit of God, completely who he is. If you actually believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God above all things, you would have no problem submitting to him. Just like John the Baptist, he must become greater, I must become the less. That's the theme of our lives as Christians. Now second, you would have no problem also envisioning an eternity that sounds enjoyable. Verse 36, last verse in this passage, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. We'll look at both sides of this. Let's look at the first part. Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. This verse sounds like a repeat of John 3, 16, does it not? Whoever believes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's basically saying the same thing. And so in the good place, we see a, a, a vision of heaven that's this glorious place where you can have whatever you want. But after millions of years, it becomes boring. Even your greatest imagination will run dry and you'll become bored. But that's not what the Bible is teaching us here about eternal life. What the Bible teaches us about eternal life, and you know, the Bible is actually pretty sparse on its imagery of heaven. There's four visions of heaven throughout the scripture. You have Isaiah with one, Elijah with one, Paul with one, and John with one. And they each are very careful with how they describe heaven. The emphasis of of each vision of heaven that you have in the scripture is not on what is there, but who is there. The emphasis, and even with that who, you might be thinking about, you know, grandma or friends, and yes, you will have old friends there, but the emphasis is on the fact that God himself is there, not on what you'll be doing, but the fact that he will be there. And I know that that might not sound extremely exciting to all of us. But as you draw nearer to him, and you really learn his ways and what he's really like and that he cares for you and that he's warm and compassionate and that he's a true father with infinite love and compassion and he wants what's best for you. When you realize that you can have that type of a relationship, that only the, the best marriage in this world is a pale, pale comparison to what we enjoy with God throughout eternity. Your heart just can become just a little bit more warm, a little more soft to what we have waiting for us. The whole point of eternal life is to enjoy perfect relationship with the infinite triune God throughout all of eternity, just as Jesus has done it in the past. Randy Alcorn, in his book on heaven, 
says this, our belief that heaven will be boring betrays a heresy, that God himself is boring. There is no greater nonsense. Our desire for pleasure and the experience of joy come directly from God's hand. He made our taste buds, adrenaline, and the nerve endings that convey pleasure to our brains. Likewise, our imaginations and capacity for joy were made by the God whom some imagine is boring. Are we so arrogant as to imagine that human beings came up with the idea of having fun? If you really believe Jesus is who he said he was, you would have no problem imagining a heaven that was not boring, that sounds enjoyable. Now, it is hard to spend this much time talking about heaven without talking about hell. And that's exactly where the author takes this passage. Verse 36, the one that we're looking at. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I would have loved to end the sermon halfway through verse 36. It would have made for a very positive experience this morning. But the the Lord's word is for us, and we have to study it all, even parts that are uncomfortable to think through. And this is one of those things that keeps many people away from Christianity. And so for us, most of us being Christians, if you're not a Christian here today, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that this is helpful for you. But we need to be equipped to think through what all of these things mean. Rebecca McLaughlin, she spoke at our retreat a couple weeks ago. In her book, um, Confronting Christianity, she answers 12 of the hardest questions for the world's largest religion, which is Christianity. And the last question she answers is, how can a loving God send people to hell? And she starts this chapter, and she says, this is the most difficult of all of these questions. It is a difficult question. It's a genuinely difficult question. She goes on to say, the idea of the wrath of God seems alien to us, a psychologically damaging relic from a bygone era. But just as we cannot absolve people of moral accountability without also erasing their ability to love, so God's love and God's judgment cannot be pulled apart. Think of the anger you feel when you see school children shot, women raped, or people beaten because of the color of their skin. Think of the anger at the slave trade, the Holocaust, and global sex trafficking. When you analyze the anger, its root is love. Anything you love that becomes threatened will cause you to feel anger. I love my children with a love that is hard to describe. And if you were to threaten my children, there would be an anger that's hard to describe. And this is why when I watched um, one of the fathers of one of the women who were assaulted by Larry Nasser in the courtroom, I don't know if, if you saw this, but there was, there's a video of one of the fathers that gets to address Larry Nasser. Larry Nasser is the, the serial uh, child abuser who assaulted at least 265 women uh, over his time at, at, in, um, at working with the gymnastics. And one of the fathers, the, the victims were allowed to speak to, to Nasser before he was sentenced. And one of the fathers stood up And he asked the judge, he said, Judge, I would ask that in in addition to whatever you're going to sentence him, you give me five minutes alone with him. Which is comical, but also, because you can only imagine what that father's going to do in five minutes. He said, no, I can't do that, I'm sorry. And he said, I'll take one minute then. When she said, no, that's not how the justice system works. The father, and this is all on video, and you you can see murder in his eyes. I mean unbelievable, the wrath that he was feeling at that moment. The, the father jumped the banister and ran to attack Larry Nasser. At that moment, he committed a crime, that father did. But no one in this room <laughs> would say it was an unjustifiable crime. He was tackled by the security and led away. He was not charged on that crime because everyone knows why. He would feel such wrath towards a man Such as this. I get this guy. I think we all do. Dane Ortland says that hell is not the problem. The absence of hell would be a problem. 
Hell is the affirmation that God is a God of justice, of fairness, of dealing with humans in a way that is right. Later on that same day or in that same trial, Rachel Denhollander, uh, she was the first one to bring accusations against Larry Nasser. Um, she spoke to him in court, and Rachel is a, is a Christian. And here what she told him. She told him that he would face a, quote, final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing and that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet because it, it, extends, it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found and it will be there for you. I pray that you should experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. That's a woman who believes the gospel and who's been empowered to forgive only because of what she has been forgiven and who she knows God to be. A God of justice and a God of love. Both. God loves and therefore he must be just. just. He simply cannot shrug. We, we get this from all the scripture. If you read the Old Testament and you don't get this, you, you're not getting it. Okay, Our God, he is a loving God, but he cannot simply shrug off sin or turn turn away from it and ignore it. Sin must be, must receive justice. That's what we have from the scripture. So when it says, whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him, what's it saying? It's saying that the wrath of God remains on that person. And what could be worse than the removal of the presence of God, the source of life, the source of joy, the source of satisfaction? What could be worse than the ultimate removal of his presence. If you do not believe in and obey the Son, that you are currently separated from God, you will remain separated from God. That's what it's saying, that the wrath of God will remain on you. And this is like C.S. Lewis's depiction of hell in The Great Divorce. Now, The Great Divorce is a little bit of a confusing novel. It's short, it's like 120 pages. It's a great novel. Um, it's fiction, of course. It's his depiction of what heaven and hell might look like. And there's some things in there that are really helpful. The, the story's uh, confusing. I'm not going to explain the entire story. But he describes hell as this place where people just get to continue in their selfishness. Because selfishness ultimately is miserable. And he famously says that the doors to hell are locked from the inside. That people who don't want anything to do with God in this life won't all of a sudden be interested in spending eternity with God. And what's interesting to me is that C.S. Lewis's depiction of hell and the great divorce is actually far more like the depiction of heaven in the good place than what the Bible describes heaven as being like. You see, heaven is not a place where you just get infinite wishes to maintain your own selfish desires. But heaven is a place where you get to enjoy true selflessness, where you are removed of yourself, emptied of yourself. You get to be yourself, but you no longer live for yourself. Just as God does not live for himself, but he sent his one and only son to bear the penalty that we deserve, selflessly dying in our place. So, both, so God is both a God of love and of wrath. And how do we reconcile these two? But there's, there's tension all over the scripture and it's finally reconciled in Jesus. Because Jesus displays the love of God for us by going to the cross and bearing the wrath of God on our behalf. Jesus endured hell in the place of all those who would believe in him and would one day enjoy heaven. And that is what he has done for us. And that is why we can delight in eternal life. And why it shapes us here today. There's so much more to be said. But the invitation is open to you today. If, and eternal life can start today. It starts the moment you trust Christ. You begin the relationship with God that will one day be made in full that you'll enjoy completely in heaven and throughout the new heavens and the new earth. And so I encourage you, if you've never trusted in Christ like that before, 
we invite you. I would love to pray with you. But for those of us who have trusted in him, this is an opportunity again to, to reset our, our hope on Christ and him alone, be reminded of what he's done for us, and to look forward to the eternity that we'll get to spend with him. Each week we participate in a sacred meal in our church to be reminded of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. We, it's a communion meal where we remember the night that Jesus was betrayed and he took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took a cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so each week as we participate in the sacred meal, we're being reminded of what God has done for us by sending his son to bear our sin and to be resurrected on the third day. And that's what we're placing our hope into. And so as we take communion, we're saying, Christ got the penalty for me. Therefore, I get the reward that he deserves. Church, let's stand and prepare our hearts to sing in response to what the Lord's done to us, for us. Father, as we come to your table, we pray that you would make our hearts soft, and that you would remind us of what you've done, that we would enjoy your presence, Enjoy what you've done for us throughout all eternity. God, we pray that now you would help anyone who is trying to decide what they should do, where they should go. God, we pray for anyone who's in the midst of, of deep repentance. We pray that you would bless them with your presence and help them to know that you have a loving embrace for sinners, that you love us despite and that you already know. And so God, we pray that as we take this communion meal, that we'll be trusting in you and depending upon you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.